Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today, we take a look at the ups and downs the literary world faced in 2020. We start not with words on paper, but audiobooks. Americans borrowed about 20% more audiobooks from libraries in the previous year. That's according to Forbes, which recently reported that audiobook sales in the United States reached nearly a billion dollars in 2018. And it left us wondering if there is more to this than convenience and clever marketing. With this, number 28 retired after a glance between him and Uriah. In 2018, the audiobook giant Audible, an Amazon company, worked with University College London on a research to see the effects of a story read to you compared to watching it on a screen. Over a hundred participants, aged between 18 and 55, watched a scene from book adaptations such as A Game of Thrones, The Girl Under Train and Pride and Prejudice. Then they listened to the same scenes on an audiobook. There was little difference in the scripts of the audio and video adaptations. But the heart rate, body temperature and electrodermal activity of the participants rose much higher when they listened to the audiobook versions. Dr. Joseph Delvin, head of experimental psychology at University College London, says the stories were more cognitively and emotionally engaging in their audio formats. The statistical evidence was very strong and consistent across all the different stories, with audiobooks producing a stronger emotional and physiological response than visual storytelling mediums. This is a result, the researchers believe, of semantic ambiguity. In other words, when we listen to a story, we're actively imagining each instance and character in our minds, whereas watching something is quite a passive action. And what we feel is basically in the control of the director. There's not much left for us to do. Mixed with all of this is some clever marketing strategies, such as making an actor read the audiobook of their latest movie. And the results? Audiobooks are booming. It happened on a Sunday. That and try simultaneously doing your laundry and reading Harry Potter. The audiobook companies say that they're all about exploring new ways of telling stories and enriching the reading experience in different formats. Oh, if he should be so far stimulated by your genius as to learn to draw himself, how delightful that would be. Alison Beverstock, professor of publishing at Kingston University, joined me and we talked about how audiobooks actually help people read more. I think there's some evidence that, yes, audiobooks are pulling in new audiences. And I think the reason is that it's the, um, the change from seeing an audiobook as a sort of alternative format. So audiobooks used to be recommended largely for children who couldn't read or for um, elderly adults who, who'd lost, whose sight wasn't good or for the completely unsighted. And I think now we're seeing them as an alternative, uh, uh, a different format. And that's pulling in people who use podcasts, who use downloads, and who engage with spoken word, who don't necessarily buy books. And certainly the profile of people who are buying them is looks to be uh, a lot of men and a lot of um, younger men who are not traditionally the, the most heavy buyers of books. So I think it is different markets. Well, of course it's not new, because actually um, being told stories is, goes back right to sort of living in caves. Um, so it's one of the oldest mediums in the world. And, I mean, authors like Dickens used to do reading tours where people would buy a ticket and go along and listen to him read. Um, but as I say, I think it became, audiobooks became conflated with special needs reading, so for the elderly or the very young or um, for those without sight at all. And um, what, I think what happened that, that changed the situation was the availability of formats which allowed um, access to to spoken word, access to, to, to reading to books um, in spoken format, uh, which enable people to do it in their own time. So the arrival of the MP3 player, the iPod, the availability of digital downloads, and now of uh, speaker um, speakers, where you can have uh, information or, or reading read to you at the time of your choosing, and also the material that you want. I think that's what's really changed um, audiobooks.
having more control on copyrights and raking in a greater percentage of revenue were two factors driving many writers to self-publish their books in 2020, including the US president's son. Donald Trump Jr.'s second book, Liberal Privilege, which came out in 2020, did not have a publisher or a solid distribution plan. But if an author is already a well-established name with a ready audience like Trump, does that mean self-publishing is the best way to go? Critic Jessa Crispin was with us to talk about the rise of self-publishing and its pros and cons for the writers. Publishing has become this very well gatekept institution. And so in order even to get a publishing deal, you have to come with an established audience. So there is a question of like, if I already have established an audience, if I have an established brand, then why exactly do I need the publishing industry? Um, particularly in this moment where bookstores are shut down, there are no public events. Um, so everything is sort of on the author themselves to create the work, create the audience, create the distribution networks. And so the question is, like, what does the publishing industry do anymore exactly? No, I think that this is a nightmare scenario. I am in no way saying that this is better than it used to be. But the situation being what it is, the publishing industry being so well gatekept and being so reliant on the independence of the writer, um, the way that the publishing industry has essentially stopped nurturing new talent or discovering new talent. You have to come to them with these sort of credentials already established um, means that uh, people who can't spend all of their time focusing on the business side of writing because they have children or they have a job or, you know, a multitude of reasons because they want to enjoy their lives um, are essentially being shut out of publishing. So this is a sort of survival mode um, at, for a lot of people. And I think that it's incredibly bad for the state of literature and the state of publishing in general. But this is this is the situation that we have to work with. The coronavirus delayed the release of many, many, many books in the UK. So, in September, 600 new titles came out all at once. Bookshelves and tablets were flooded with big names, such as J.K. Rowling, Elena Ferrante, Martin Amis and Jamie Oliver. At the same time, there were a number of books by upcoming authors, but their publishers were worried that the spotlight might not be bright enough to shine on all these writers at the same time. Kate Wilson, the managing director of Nosy Crow Publishing, explained why so many books came out all at once in the UK and the logic behind the marketing strategy of the publishers. I think that what happened was that for the months of May and June and sometimes for July, many publishers didn't publish. Our bookshops were closed. And so we're looking at um, a full year's worth of books coming out in September. We're looking at some of those titles that would have been published in May, June, and July being published. So the increase is significant, but it's not overwhelming. The truth is that September and October are always our biggest publishing months. They are always the month that publishers focus their strongest selling titles. So to some degree, this is just a little bit more than we've always had. Well, the truth is that there was effectively two channels to market left for us in the UK. There was um, online, and that's predominantly Amazon here in the UK, and there were supermarkets. So places where people were going to buy food and other essentials, and they were also able to buy books. But for a while, Amazon deprioritized books. So they said it was so important to get food and other essentials to people online that they weren't considering books as essential items. And honestly, the same was true for the supermarkets. People were buying lots of rice and lots of toilet roll, and they were um, really, the shops were really struggling to keep books on the shelves. So for a long time, we were being 
advised by Amazon and the supermarkets that it was hard for them to match in Facebook, like get, um, get them out of shelves. And so, and all of our bookshops were closed. And we love our bookshops. And so the idea of allowing books to go out into the trade without them benefiting bookshops was something that worried us. So many of us decided in the huge uncertainty of the time around April and May, not to publish for a couple of months. Mm -hmm. Some of us, as already said, chose then to publish in September or October, but many books come back in 2021. So as a publisher myself, I am publishing a few more books in September, but honestly, a book that is about going on holiday to the beach, there's no point in publishing that in September. That we had to hold on all the mm -hmm. way through 2021. Literary critic Christian Lorenzen told Showcase that novels written by Gen X authors today are reflecting their midlife crisis. But Lorenzen says don't expect the characters in today's books to buy a sports car or date a 21-year-old. For him, that's so 1995. Instead, modern-day protagonists are facing the dilemmas of climate change and the rise of far right. And just like these issues are pushing society to the brink, so are the characters. Christian Lorenzen was here to talk about what he meant in his original Book Forum article. Instead of cliches that are born out of uh, midlife prosperity, where suddenly a character finds himself with uh, too much money and not enough freedom, what we have are crises that go along with the uh, a precarity of youth that's never ended. So prosperity that a middle-class person expects in midlife has never shown up, and then everything starts to fall apart. The character then identifies his own personal crisis with the crisis going on in the world, whether that might be climate change or a natural disaster or a political crisis like uh, fascism rising in America. It's a reluctance to grow up, yes, but also uh, the fact that the, the comforts of adulthood uh, never come. You know, it, one's 20s and 30s are usually financially precarious, but because of the financial crisis of 2008 and now what's going on, uh, and a, basically a second crisis, these um, the prosperity of midlife never arrives. Youth, instead of feeling like it's been lost, uh, has simply atrophied. Uh, I think a lot of it, on the one hand, it comes along with uh, the economic conditions that have occurred um, in our uh 40s and I guess for the older Gen Xers, 50s, where the post-war boom um, that were that characterized um, economic life in the 80s and 90s simply hasn't been there for us. Mm -hmm. uh, uh -huh. The rug has been pulled out, and in addition, in our youths, we had a mentality that. Um, uh, we had a, the idea of the sellout. So never having sold out, we never really got paid. One of the biggest book events of the calendar, the Frankfurt Book Fair, did not cancel like many others this year. Instead, it went digital for all but a few locals. It may not seem that way, but this is the world's largest book fair. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, the Frankfurt Book Fair went completely digital. All the usual author discussions, bookish panels and other events are being done over video conferences. We had to react right away. We had originally planned to have a small audience, 
a few hundred people here in the main hall. We had to cancel that immediately. But the stage is set and welcomes authors from all over Germany, as well as international writers. And we have set up a broadcasting center to share these talks all over the world. In an interview with Deutsche Welle, the director Jürgen Buss also says the single biggest upside of our digital fair is that mostly everyone can join. He means that before the pandemic, some publishers or writers who wanted to attend to the fair but because of financial or visa-related impediments were unable to do so. Now that everything is at the tip of their fingers, the fair is considered as the most inclusive in their history this year. But there's still some face-to-face -face interaction for the locals, but it's all socially distanced. I thought the conditions would be such that I wouldn't feel in danger. I expected the event to be organized in such a way that there would be a lot of distance between people, and I was really happy to get a ticket. While this year's edition had to adapt to current health crisis, some industry executives question whether or not this virtual setup is the future of book fairs. Though the Frankfurt Book Fair director claims without personal encounters, it's not easy to have a book fair. COVID-19 restrictions financially hurt independent booksellers in 2020, which were already in a bind thanks to the likes of Amazon. But these mom-and-pop establishments saw the startup of bookshop.org. Sellers that don't have an online store can now join the website, and they, along with the authors, get more than 75% of the profits. Bookshop.org began operating in the United States and the UK, but the hope is to expand around the world. The founder and CEO of Bookshop.org, Andy Hunter, introduced his project to us. But we also asked him about the importance of supporting local businesses. Yeah, well, for the past um, 10 or 15 years, Amazon has been growing at a, at a rapid pace and has taken control over 50% of the market uh, for book sales. And independent bookstores are essential for a uh, culture around books. You know, they're really wonderful places where children's schools, book groups, book clubs, authors, everybody and readers connect to each other. And they're really essential for having a healthy culture around books. So um, I wanted to make sure that they were going to be sustainable in the future. And that meant they need to be able to sell books online and their loyal customers who love them need to be able to support them when they buy books online and not just shop on, um, on other online retailers. So we wanted to create a simple platform where it was really easy without any financial commitment, without any money or um, technical knowledge, a bookstore could set up a page online and start selling books to their customers. Um, and yeah, that's why we launched it. And so far, it's been really great. We have 900 stores in the US that are on the platform and over 250 stores in the UK. We really came up with it just to ensure a healthy, sustainable future for bookstores. As more and more people shop online, we just want to make sure that bookstores have an e-commerce strategy that they can live with that's easy for them and that's easy for the customers. So bookshop.org was created to make it all simple and it was really working. But when um, when COVID-19 hit, it became essential. Like it might've been optional before for them to have, an, have a website. It might've been a nice to have, but when um, Bookshop launched and then COVID-19 hit six weeks later, suddenly stores couldn't put their employees at health at risk by having them come into work. Sometimes there were shutdown orders and the stores were not able to fulfill orders. And so having an, a way to sell books online and deliver them directly to people's home became completely essential. So while it, while it wasn't created to, uh, solve COVID-19 issues, mm -hmm. it ended up being a great solution for COVID-19. Well, it's a socially conscious value for sure. If all you care about is price, if that's all that matters to you, then you can continue to shop on Amazon. If you care about human beings and you care about your high street and your communities, um, then supporting local businesses is extremely important. Uh, you know, we connect with each other in common places, in places like bookstores, in downtowns or high streets, that's where communities gather. And that's where like really great people work. 
And for readers, bookstores often were like gateways into a love of reading. When I was a kid and I would go into a bookstore, I would just sit in the aisles for hours and hours. They were my favorite places to go. And I dedicated my life to books after that. Bookstores work with schools, they work with libraries, they work with all kinds of institutions in their communities. And they're really, really important. And if you want to like shop on bookshop.org, what you're doing is you're saying, I care, I understand that where I spend my money matters. It makes a difference to my community. And I don't mind paying an extra 50 cents or dollar in order to make sure that I'm supporting my values when I shop online. Mm -hmm. And that I care that when the pandemic's over, I emerge into a world that I want to live in, where there are still bookstores, where downtowns are not filled with shuttered, shuttered storefronts. You know, we want to have restaurants. We want to have live like bookstores. We want to have all kinds of local businesses still around after the pandemic, and they're yeah. all suffering right now. Amazon's not suffering. Amazon is up. You know, their sales are at a record high. <laughs> so they don't need your money right now, but small businesses do. Well, one iconic bookseller in Paris could probably have benefited from an organization like bookshop.org. Shakespeare and Company is battling financial woes stemming from Amazon and COVID-19. And the company is looking for a survival plan. The famous bookstore Shakespeare and Company is one of Paris's biggest tourist attractions. The likes of F. Scott Fitzgerald and James Joyce used to frequent this place. However, this century-old shop is in an economic crisis. Like many businesses, it's been badly impacted by the pandemic. Though they were not in a great place before either. Yellow vest protests and the nearby Notre Dame Cathedral fire have also impacted the bookshop's revenue. And now, a second lockdown. We've been um, minus 80% since the first confinement, so uh, since March. And so at this point, we've used all our savings. We've, um, we have applied for and received quite a lot of support from the French government. Um, but we're just concerned about the future because there's uh, we feel that we're probably going to have a, another year of um, difficulty. The owner, Sylvia Whitman, says that difficulty also stems from the competition of online retailers. Buying books online has been a convenient way to shop during the pandemic, and it has put her business in a more dangerous spot. I understand why um, people will be using large online platforms more at the moment. It, they offer a good service, uh, a lot of us are stuck at home. Uh, I understand that, but it comes at a cost and I, I find it really tiring that it seems to be the bigger you are, uh, the more you can ignore laws, you can avoid taxes, you can um, uh, find loopholes, should we say. Uh, and the smaller you are, the more expensive and the more, uh, the more complicated things are. Though to stay in business, she's been inspired by the company's history. During the Great Depression, the founder of the shop, Sylvia Beach, reached out to her friends to keep the Shakespeare and Company running. Today, the current owner, Whitman, is planning to create an online network called Friends of Shakespeare and Company, hoping it would be the solution to her problems. Northern England is home to what some call British brutalism. Just ask Simon Phipps. His Brutal North is considered a book of concrete poetry. It catalogues Phipps's black and white photography of the area's architecture. Phipps captured everything from prominent buildings to bus stations and bridges. I talked to Simon Phipps about his book and why he loves brutalism in architecture so much. Uh, well, I've done a number of books uh, about um, modernist brutalist architecture around um, the UK. 
uh, and a, bo a book about um, modernist sculpture in the UK. And I've traveled quite a lot to the north and been um, really impressed by the range of uh, and scope of modernist architecture in the in the northern regions. So I thought it would be mm -hmm. it's very timely to do a book about the north. Well, I'm not sure it's unique, but there's certainly some excellent examples of, of uh, modernism and brutalism in the north of England. And I really just wanted to bring that to light and put that into sort of one volume and show this breadth of wonderful architecture uh, that had been commissioned um, post-war by many uh, councils and municipal um, uh, governmental <laughs> bodies. Um, so, you know, big cities like Sheffield and Newcastle and Manchester all had their own architectural departments and commissioned this uh, amazing array of architecture, that some of which still survives, some of which has sadly been um, demolished over the last few couple of decades. So it's also good as a sort of record of what's still there, um, what's still existing. That's it for a look at the literary world in 2020. Be sure to check out Showcase's YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter accounts. I'm Ilf Bereketli, bye for now.